Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mark Moss Show, where we talk about each and every week. We talk about the way the world is changing. Of course, we talk about the technological revolution, the decentralized revolution, as I like to call it, as we're witnessing the world change uh, through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. And the world of finance, I mean, all three of these are changing rapidly. Of course, they all affect each other, but we are witnessing something going on this week something massive, something for the history books, as a matter of fact. History books will be written about this point in time, exactly what's going on. And I am talking about one of the biggest banks in the world, uh, a sovereign bank. The Bank of England has broke. Now, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. We are witnessing central banks around the world breaking. We're not talking about, you know, in 2008 during the great financial crash when the investment banks were down, we're talking about sovereign banks, national banks, central banks, and they are breaking. So we want to talk about that the way the financial system is changing, obviously the political side that's scrambling, and of course the technology that's sitting there waiting in the winds uh, and appears to be ready to move into prime time. Of course, we are talking about Bitcoin. And so we're going to break all of this down. I want to break down exactly what's going on uh, with the Bank of England, what happened, how the contagion is spreading to all the other central banks. I want to go back through some of the history of money so you can understand exactly how this works and why this is happening, of course. And then we'll get back into the currency wars that are happening now between all the banks, uh, the danger that we're witnessing in China, uh, Japan, uh, the UK, of course, in the United States. And uh, we'll talk about Bitcoin. Is it ready to um, make its prime time appearance? Could it be a, a recipient or a beneficiary of all of this? And so we got a lot to cover. We're going to get through all this today. Hopefully, if I can talk fast enough. So uh, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to the Mark Moss Show, and we are digging into it. So like I said, the big news, the Bank of England has broke. Now, the Bank of England's broke before. As a matter of fact, Everybody's uh, favorite uh, government overthrower, uh, George Soros, he got famously rich from breaking the Bank of England in a single day, making a billion dollars in a single day. And, you know, central banks, they're destined to fail. You can't create money from thin air. It just doesn't work. Now, it does for a long enough period of time until it distorts things so bad that they, in they get inevitably so bad that they break. And that's kind of where we're at. We saw the Bank of England break. Now, um, the UK is still there. The Bank of England is still there. But they have basically, uh, it's like if you're playing a game of poker, they've put it all in. All chips are in. And if they're not able to hold this up right now, which I don't think they'll be able to, then all trust is gone and they're going to disappear. That's why they've had to put all chips in. So let's talk about that uh, for a little bit. And then we'll get into uh, how this works. Like I said, I want to go through some of the history. But uh, real fast, let's just talk about the history a little bit so you can understand this. I, I like to talk about it from a, uh, from a first principles level. If we can break this down simply where you can understand it, um, then you can understand it and it's more complex. But if you try to understand it and it's more complex, it's, it's very difficult to understand. And so um, central banks, the Bank of England being the first central bank uh, that was created in the late 1600s. Now, um, there's a great book, uh, I believe it was written by, by Murray Rothbard. You can find it on Mises.org for free. It's The Mystery of Central Banking. Great book. Highly recommend it. I'm going to repeat it again. Mystery of Central Banking. You go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org. You can download it for free. Or of course, you can buy it as well. You can download the PDF version or, or buy the physical book to be sent to your house. Um, and so in, in that book, they really document how this was put together. And so let me just uh, give you this first. Actually, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit further. Let's go back to... Uh, let's let's go back uh, let's go back a thousand years and then we'll then we'll jump to the creation of the Bank of England that's breaking right now. So if we go back uh, in time, uh, gold has been money for most of recorded history. Of course, uh, before money, before the, there was a medium of exchange, we just had barter, so we'd trade uh, you know food 
things like that. We'd trade a cow for a chicken. We'd trade clothes for wood, things like that. And so we'd have barter, of course, that's very inefficient, and it only works in very small localized economies. And so we needed a, a price for things, and uh, we needed to have this medium of exchange that could communicate this price, and so it would al allow us to have this trade. Uh, mediums of exchange are emergent, and so if you don't want my chicken, my goat, uh, my wood, my clothes, um, then would you take this other thing instead? This became a medium of exchange. It's not, it's not the thing I wanted, but it allows me to um, use that to get what I do want. So I like to say, um, it's, it's very controversial, <laughs> that you don't want money. And people go, what? What do, you, what do you mean? Of course I want money. I want as much money as I can get. No, you don't. What you want is the things that money will buy you. That's what you want. Uh, money allows us to park our, our value, our stored up energy, until such a time we're ready to deploy that to get actually what it is that we want, which is a vacation, a dinner out, a new car, new clothes, etc. And so what we want is the things, but that medium exchange allows us to get all of those things, or like I said, store our energy until we're ready to do that. Now, um, what we use as, as this medium exchange has evolved, and uh, it's been feathers and seashells and rocks and all types of things. And gold became the best medium of exchange. But before gold became a medium of exchange, uh, we had lots of things. Um, and really what happened is we saw all of these different medium of exchange. Barley was one medium of exchange that worked for a really long time. Um, and then we started getting coins. And so then there was a, a new technology. Remember, it's always technology that changes the world. Through thousands of years of history, it's always technology, which is why we look at the world changing through three lenses, political, financial, and technological. Now, um, this technology that was created was coins. And so we could take metals, we could take copper, we could take gold, we could take silver, and we could make coins out of them. Now, this became a good medium exchange. The problem is, is who made the coin and, and how pure is the coin and do we recognize it? So it still worked in a very regional location, in a, in a regional area. Obviously, some people had more access to these metals than other areas did, which then allowed them to have more wealth because they could print more of these coins. Um, but that was a technological revolution, a technological breakthrough that really happened and allowed global trade to speed up. Now, the thing that's important to understand, and we're going to come back to this theme over and over and over, is that as the money supply increases, so does the rest of the economy. So if there's more um, whatever, gold, silver, whatever coins to go around, then more people will go out and do more things. I'll make more clothes, I'll make more food, I'll build more houses because there's more money to go around. So as the money supply increases, um, so do typically the economic output of that area as well. But it also increases inflation. That means the price is going up. So you remember, we don't want money what we want is the things that money buys us, the goods and services. So you would take all the goods and services, and so in a small little economy, you have some coconuts, you have some fish, and you have some a guy that can help you build your hut. That's it, right? If you increase the money, then it increases the demand for those things, the coconut, the fish, and the guy that can build the hut. And so all of a sudden, more money creates more demand, but we didn't increase the amount of fish or the coconuts or the guys that can build the houses. And so it pushes the prices of those things up. More money equals more demand equals prices going higher. All right, that makes sense. So throughout history, we can revisit this over and over and over. As the money supply increases, it creates inflation. All right, you hear about inflation all over. Now you understand how this works. So now that we've kind of developed that, let's jump back to about 1500 AD. So about 500, uh, 500 years ago or so. And there was a big discovery that changed the world. It changed the power balance of the world. It changed the inflation of the world. And uh, it really sent the world in this direction. Before we get into that, just letting you know, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We're talking about the decentralized revolution, the way the world is changing right now before our very eyes. We're talking about the Bank of England just failed. And we're setting up the history so you can understand how this works. And then we'll explain what's going on and what you should be doing to prepare for it. Um, Central banks around the world are, fa are failing. The Bank of England just broke this week. We're talking about history, so we were just stopping at 1500. And so uh, the world, we have this global trade going on. Uh, we have these coins. And all of a sudden, there was a discovery 
in the 1500s um, by Spain. Spain was uh, out across the world looking for uh, more wealth, more riches, right? And they found it. They found a, um, the Spanish conquistadors um, found the Inca Empire, you know, in South America in the 1500s. And they found the richest silver deposit in the world on a high mountain of 4,800 meters, which is about 15,000 feet feet way up there way up there and the spaniards called this the cerro rico or the rich mountain and it was over thirteen thousand feet now once they found that then this mining town um, boomed um they uh you know started digging these deep holes they on uh, you know enslaved the the local indigenous people there uh made them get all of this silver out of the ground there was also lead in there which of course is really bad for you Lots of, it was, it was very hazardous uh, work, let's just call it that. Uh, but, the, but the Spanish were able to get all of this silver out of the ground, and it was the largest silver discovery in the world at that time. And then they uh, took all that Spain, they, uh, I'm sorry, that, all that silver, they took it back to Spain, um, and it increased the money supply. Uh, between, let's see, during the 16th century, the population of Potosi, Potosi is where they had the silver mine, it grew to over 200,000, and its silver mine became the source of 60% of the world's silver. Between 1545 and 1800, it produced 20% of all known silver produced in the world. So massive. So it became the source of 60% of the world's silver. So it exploded the money supply. When you explode the money supply, what happens? Again, you have more money chasing the same goods which creates inflation also more people will go to make more goods because there's more money when you have a lot of money you buy stuff you don't necessarily need you buy stuff that you want and if you have even more money and people offer you other stuff you're like oh sure i'll take that too and so it created this massive growth massive prosperity well, it was a good thing uh, massive trade massive growth massive prosperity massive progress all types of new uh, products and tools and inventions and all of these things and inflation because as you inflate the money supply, you get it. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, you get the growth, but you also get the prices going up. You also get the inflation. Now, we can fast forward a few hundred years. Like I said, that goes to about the early 1800s. And in the early 1800s, um, something else happened. Now, what, uh, just real quick to highlight this, what happened is all the silver came into the world and then the mine started to run out. So we were increasing the money supply for a long time, and we had massive growth, 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 at a breakneck pace, right? Everything's going up in value, everything's exploding, more products, more services, all these things. But then the mine starts running out of silver. So the, the, the money supply, the silver, is adding to the world supply at a breakneck speed. Growth, prosperity, prices, everything at a breakneck speed. And then all of a sudden, the money starts running out. The money supply starts going down, which then causes massive contraction. Now, you have all these people that need all these things, that want all these things, that are trying to sell all these things, and now there's not enough money to go around. Okay? That's the theme. You increase the money supply, you get massive booms. You decrease the money supply, you get the opposite of that, which is a massive bust, all right? So we're gonna follow this all the way through to what's happening to the Bank of England right now today. Now, going back, here we are, um, 1800s, we're in England, and Sir Isaac Newton, you might've heard of him before, and Sir Isaac Newton, um, he came up with uh, a new way uh, to get metal, and that was the gold the gold standard. So um, he said, hey, let's, uh, let's use this new type of money. We're going to move to gold. And so England did. Uh, they were able to, get, able to get more gold into the system. Gold took over at a, a higher uh, volume, or I'm sorry, a higher value than what the silver did. And so it took off. Uh, the United States was uh, formerly on a bimetal standard, so they were using gold and silver at the time. Um, they switched over to gold in 1834. Um, and then really by the end of the 1800s, uh, Congress passed a, a gold standard act. Um, and so in 1834, the United States went onto a gold standard, fixed the price of gold at $20 per ounce. Um, and the rest of the world started moving on to a gold standard. Now, um, China, just a tidbit note here, China said, no, we're not moving to the gold standard. We're going to stay on the silver standard. We don't want that gold. We're going to stick with what we have silver because they had so much silver and they didn't want to give up their silver. 
and they lost their position in the world because the value of silver plummeted. Everyone moved to gold. Now, again, so the, so the amount of gold exploded. Uh, wealth exploded again. So the money supply had dipped, and now it started going back up again. Again, massive growth, massive prosperity, massive inflation. Prices were going up. We had more things to buy. Then what happens is then we go into World War One. And um, this is where we'll go to the, bank, the, the creation of the Bank of England. We, we, we didn't skip, we skipped that part. And so in the late 1600s, back to the mystery of central banking, um, England was going to war with France and they needed more money. And you can't just go create more silver or gold out of thin air and they didn't have it. So a group of bankers, so at the time, kings would borrow money from the rich people and they'd borrow money typically for social programs or most likely for war and so they needed money for the war and so the so the king said hey rich guys uh we need money <laughs> we need money for this war with france and the and the rich guys said hey okay sure no problem we got you we got your back don't worry uh here's what we're going to do though um we're going to give you as much money as you want as a matter of fact we're going to give you an unlimited supply of money and the, the king's like wow that's awesome great cool what let's do it and they said, but here, here's the catch. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to create our own bank. It's called the Bank of England. And we're going to create our own form of money, our paper money. And we're going to give you as much of that money as you want. The catch is, is that you have to tell the people in England that um, our bank is recognized by the crown. Um, it's by the government. Uh, we are the only bank and they have to use our money. And if you do that, you tell them that our bank is the, is the bank they should use and they have to use our fake money, then we'll give you as much of this fake money as you wanted, which when you understand it said that way, it sounds like a big scam, doesn't it? And if you think it does sound like a big scam, then you are on to something. And of course, so the, the king said, sure, fine. Okay, your bank is recognized. We'll use your money and they'll take more of it. They got all this money. They went into the war, into World War I, um, and they printed all this fake money. They didn't have enough gold, um, which was the real money. They printed all this fake money. And then at the end of the war, they didn't have the money they needed. So the money supply went up. It expanded and then the money supply shrank and it went into a massive depression that led into uh, the Great Depression in the United States. Uh, I want to talk to you the rest of the way, the way through this. We're going to skip forward and show you the problems that we have today because the UK, the Bank of England just broke this week. China's running out of money. Japan's running out of money. And yes, even the United States is running out of money. That's why the prices of everything are dropping. The money supply is decreasing. All this gold was needed to fight the war. The United States basically stayed out of the war. It was all happening over in Europe. So England and France and Germany, Russia, they're all fighting. They're all destroying each other's um, countries. U.S. is over here um, getting rich because we have all the we can make all the food. We have all the energy. We're selling all this stuff over to Europe. And so as we're sending them all the supplies for the war, they're sending us all the gold. And at the end of uh, the war, the U.S. at the end of World War II, the U.S. had all the gold because they stayed out of the war for the most part. They got engaged uh, uh, later, uh, but for the most part, and we didn't, our, the war happened in Europe, so the United States didn't get torn down. We didn't get deindustrialized, so we didn't need all the money to rebuild everything. But over in Europe, they destroyed everybody's countries. Uh, they spent all their gold, and now they had to rebuild everything, and they had these massive debts. So the U.S. ended up with the majority, about 90% of the gold in the world at the time. And so in 1944, they said, okay, hey, here's the new standard. It's a Bretton Woods system. Uh, the U.S. has all the gold. They'll create the dollar pegged to the gold. And uh, we'll create our own currencies, but we'll peg them back to the dollar. Now, the dollar being the reserve currency of the world has to supply the dollars to the world. Remember, the more money that comes out, the more we have booms. When the money supply contracts, we have busts. So... The, the Federal Reserve starts printing money. They start shipping these dollars all around the world. The problem is that it's a balance, as we talked about, right? When you create more money, when you increase the money supply, that's called inflation, all right? When you create inflation, when you inflate the money supply, yes, you get growth. Yes, you get economic booms. You also get inflation. You get both. Because now we have more money chasing goods and so the prices of those goods go up now if 
hypothetically, if this is what this is what the central bank dreams about, the Federal Reserve dreams about, if hypothetically we could, well, I say hypothetically, it's their goal. I say hypothetically because we never get there. Hypothetically, if we could increase the money supply by 2% per year, that's their goal, 2% inflation, and we could grow the economy, meaning the, grow the amount of goods and services being created by 2% a year, then we wouldn't actually have inflation. We would be just we would be creating more money at the same rate as goods and services. It would be perfect equilibrium. It'd be utopia. The problem is there's no such thing as utopia, and that's not how it works. And so we get to the situation where they're having to print more money and more money and more money, but we're not getting the goods and services to grow along with it, and we get inflation. So inflation gets too high. Oh, we got to pull back on the money supply. Boom, we get a crash. Oh, everything crashes. Uh, no, no one can afford to live. We're in the Great Depression. And so, okay, well, let's, let's print more money again. So we print more money again. Things start going good again. We're going to another big boom. Houses are being built. Cars are being built. Businesses are being uh, formed. Uh, but then we printed too much money, more than the goods and services. And so we have too much inflation and we have to pull back on the lever again. Sound familiar? That's exactly where we're at today. Inflation is raging high because we printed way too much money. And now they're pulling back on the money supply and you're watching your retirement account shrink. You're watching your home valuation shrink. You're watching everything shrink because they're pulling back on the money supply. Now, if this sounds a little bit insane, you uh, would be correct. It is absolutely insane. As a matter of fact, the, uh, nobody should have the power to do this. Nobody should have the power to um, increase and decrease the monetary supply um, just arbitrarily in my opinion, anyway. Now, this is the most important situation in the world right now, all right? The Bank of England's broke, and I believe the central banks around the world are also going to break. We're witnessing the sovereign debt bubble. So let's kind of go through this a little bit to kind of frame this up. Um, all right, so uh, before we go through that, I mean, we can just see all right, here we have. Let's go through this. So uh, to kind of frame this up a little bit, um, like I said, you kind of have to understand the central bank's operates. We've kind of gone through that. Their goal of the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is, is two things, stable prices and full employment. Now, I'd say they're doing pretty bad at both of those. We certainly don't have uh, stable prices when the price of your home or the price of your stock goes up by 100, 200, 300 percent. That's certainly uh, the opposite of stable prices. Um, but that's uh, what their goal is, so they're, they're, they're effectively failing at that. Now, what's happened is, again, um, we had way too much money created, way too much inflation. So the central banks, the Federal Reserve, they start raising rates, right? They're tightening monetary system. Now, because we live in a debt-based monetary system, that means, you know, you hear about um, – <clears throat> The central banks are going to print money. They don't really print money. What they do is they lower rates because we're in a debt-based system. Money is created through debt. So when you go to the bank to get a loan for a house, a car, a boat, whatever, that money is created into existence. Money is created into existence when you take a loan. So when they start tightening things, when the Fed starts raising rates, you hear about this, they start raising rates, well, then people borrow less. Less money is being created into existence. Now, all told, from about 20, 2020 to 2021, um, central banks printed or, or pumped in about $10 trillion into the system, right? So you get all this extra money chasing the same limited amounts of goods. And at the same time, you get all these supply chain disruptions. So you get less goods. You get massive amounts of inflation. Now, we have witnessed both the central banks. And so the, the main central banks really uh, would be like tier one central banks. And so, of course, the Federal Reserve sits at the top of that. The reason why the Federal Reserve sits at the top of that is because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Uh, about 80% uh, of transactions are in the dollar currency. So it takes up that. As a matter of fact, the USD is involved in over 90% of currency transaction. The Euro is involved in 20% of uh, currency transactions. And the Japanese yen is involved in about 17%. So those three banks, the Fed for the United States, the ECB, European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan are the three main banks. Uh, Bank of England is the next one. They're the fourth one in line there. 
And so uh, they've created way too much money. And so they had to start raising rates. And what we witnessed is these knee jerk reactions. I, I say it, I've said it before, if you tune in regularly, um, if you don't, <laughs> you should. Um, also, you can check me out on YouTube, just search Mark Moss on YouTube. And I put these uh, shows on um, YouTube on my Market Disruptors channel if you wanna watch me and listen to me at the same time. And so they don't have the precision of a, of a, of a surgeon with a scalpel. Instead, they just have these knee jerk reactions. And so what we witnessed is that um, in the 2020 panic, they, they dropped rates at the fastest rate in history. They didn't do it orderly. They didn't do it intentionally. They didn't do it thoughtfully. They just dropped them as fast as they can. Let's just get liquidity in the system. And then instead of adjusting when they were getting the, um, the moves they wanted, they left them there for way too long. And then what we're witnessing is the three of these, the three of these main banks now are going through a monetary tightening cycle at the fastest rate in history. So it's not just like this orderly, thoughtful um, decrease and then a, th a thoughtful, orderly increase. No, this is a panic. It's a panic. Uh, they have accomplished moves that would typically take about three years to happen, and they've done it in months. All right. The problem is, is that we're in a debt-based system. So all the governments, the United States, the UK, the EU, they need debt, right? We're all spending more than we make. We run these deficits. And so we need to keep borrowing money. But when you increase the borrowing rates, then what happens? Things start to break. You start, you're not, you're not able to afford those things. Now, if we look at the United States, for example, we've seen the two year treasury. That's the, that's the amount of interest they pay go from 0.25% to 4%. And the S&P, dropped from 47 to 36. And basically what we saw is in the UK, the government, the United Kingdom, which has the Bank of England that runs it, uh, they broke. And basically what happened is, uh, again, they, they, they eased situations by dropping rates at the fastest rate in history, and then they raised rates at the fastest rate in history. No big deal. Let's just panic and see what happens. Not, maybe something will break. And what happens is at the same time, uh, the, the UK government switched, the parliament switched. And so again, we have to look at the pol polit political side. And so Boris Johnson stepped down and we got a new person in, of course, that's Liz Truss. She's come in and she's determined to, of course, make things better. Who wouldn't want to make things better? Liz Truss, the United Kingdom's new prime minister, um, unfortunately came in and took over a very difficult situation, a time when... <laughs> A time when these debt bubbles are blowing up and there's really no choice. If you don't keep pumping them full of money, they deflate. And if you do, then you keep getting um, um, hyperinflation. And on top of that, they've created all these insane policies like getting rid of all our energy. And that's part of why, or, or really it's the, the main reason why we have so much inflation. Now she came in fired up, she's ready to make a change. And she announced the largest UK tax cuts in 50 years. Now, I think that's a good, th it's a good thing. Um, cutting taxes will leave more money with the producers, the people that produce wealth, and you'll get more wealth because of it. The problem is when they're already in such a major deficit in debt, it's very difficult, your, your back's against the wall. And so uh, even though I believe it'd probably have a better long-term um, result for them, short-term it hurts. It, short term, it, it cuts their um, revenue. The estimated cost is $50 billion of revenue that they're gonna lose. And on top of it at a time, because energy prices are so high, because of course they've chosen not to get their own energy out of the ground. Now they're, they're changing that right now. Uh, but energy prices are so high that businesses are shutting down. Uh, households are running out of money. And so they've agreed to subsidize those. And that's an extra $150 billion. So they're going to lose $50 billion in taxes. And they have to pay $150 billion to subsidize the high, the high prices that they've caused. So it's a serious problem that they're in, and there's really no easy way out of these things once you get into them. In the UK, they have this serious inflation problem and this balance of payments problem. Like I said, the, the soaring energy prices, inflation's at double digit levels. In the United States, we're just over 8%. Well, that's per the official number, we're much higher than that. Uh, but in the UK, they're over double digits. The worst it's been in 40 years, similar to like what we have right here. Their, their currency has lost 20% of its value to the US dollar. And so the Bank of England, which is the central bank for the UK, is stuck in this 
rock in a hard place. The same all central banks are. They've, they've backed themselves into this corner. And if they fail to raise rates aggressively enough, then inflation is going to continue to raise on as their currency loses value. So that works both ways. So as the currency is losing value, the currency is buying less goods and services, the inflation goes up. So those, those work opposite, right? So as prices go higher, what it really means is your dollar or your currency is buying you less. So the currency is crashing, prices are going up. It's really the same thing. It's opposite sides. Makes sense. And so they start raising interest rates to try to shore up the currency and bring inflation back down. But the problem is, is that the borrowing costs get so high that the country's public finances are even worse. And so what happened is as it started crashing, the currency started crashing, the bond market, which a lot of pensions are in the bond market, started crashing. So all the people that are uh, planning on retiring in the UK one day that have their pension funds in there, they were all going bust. People were about to lose all of their money. And most likely they will. And it's probably going to happen to you in the United States as well. So take this as a warning. You have your money your retirement, where is that money? Where is your retirement account? Most likely, if you've listened to your financial advisor, it's 60% stocks, it's 40% bonds. Where are those bonds? That bond is debt. Who has that debt? What if they can't afford to pay you? Then it goes bust. So they have some of this, um, some of these pensioners have their debt in the Bank of England, or I'm sorry, with the UK. And it was all going bust. And so the UK had no choice but to step in and to start to pump it back up. They had no choice, which is exactly what the United States will be forced to at some point as well. The problem is, is that the Bank of England is the first major central bank to be broken by the markets. They had to announce that they're going to begin unlimited quantitative easing, unlimited money printing into the market to support these UK bonds. So now they've basically, as I said from the beginning, they've pushed their chips all in. We're all in. They said unlimited. We're going to do unlimited to support it. So that's good, right? <clears throat> the, the sovereign bonds dropped, the yields dropped, and the dollar, the, or not the dollar, their pound, their pound started rallying. Good. We have the support from the central bank. The pound is rallying. It shows that it, it's liking that, all right? But what happens from this point is absolutely critical because they're all in. So if the yield on those UK bonds start going back up again, and subsequently the British pound starts collapsing again, it means the Bank of England has lost all credibility because they're all in. So we would be talking about a major central bank for a developed nation losing credibility with the markets. Now at the point of this recording right now, it's too early to tell this just happened. But this is the most important situation in the world right now. I'm going to say that again. This is the most important situation in the world right now. If things go south from here, the UK is going to go bust. What does that mean? What does that mean? We're, seeing, we're, wit we're witnessing the British pound falling so fast. The decline is, uh, we'll say, uh, worrisome to think the least. That they've said they'll do whatever it takes. Now, you would think by them saying that it would actually have a bigger impact, but it's not. Now, some of you might be asking, well, it seems like stocks rallied this week. And they did. So why did stocks rally off of that? Well, one, I think investors foolishly think that the, the Bank of England, if the Bank of England was forced to pivot from their tightening, um, and they're going to start easing, pushing the market back up, then the Fed's probably going to do the same, right? Everyone's waiting for the Fed to pivot. When will the Fed pivot? Um, and I don't, I, I don't know if, if people think that's a good idea to go long stocks when central banks are literally on the verge of losing credibility. Because if they don't, if this doesn't work, this whole system is coming crashing down. Now, what's interesting is as this whole system is about to come crashing down, Bitcoin seems to be holding up pretty good. As a matter of fact, Bitcoin is um, kind of pumping on the news. Now, I, I, I don't like to use the word pumping because it, it's not moving by a whole lot, but it seems to be responding favorably to this. Now, you might remember that Bitcoin was created in 2008, 
at the great financial crash. In the very first line of code that the creator Satoshi Nakamoto put forward, he put a message in the code. And he said, the chancellor is on the brink of a second bailout. It was created specifically for the crash of 2008. And here we are at the crash of 2022. Potentially, maybe it, maybe it might last into 2023. And here we have Bitcoin ready to go. Now, as uh, the central bankers start losing, continue losing credibility, they're at the end of the rope. Now, we're already seeing them collapse in Lebanon and Argentina and Peru and Ecuador and Sri Lanka. Uh, we're already seeing them collapse on all those. Those are tier three, tier four. But when it happens in the Bank of England in a tier two central bank, people realize the game is up. How about we have a system with no central bankers, with no one's ability to inflate and deflate the money supply at will? And that's exactly what Bitcoin is intended to do. That's what it's here for. You've been listening to The Mark Moss Show explaining to you what is going on. The most dangerous situation in the world today, the Bank of England, is breaking. You better keep your eye on it because it is going to affect you no matter where you're at in the world. And that's what I got. Thanks so much for listening. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably going to really like this video right here and this video right here.